foot, toes, heel, and every part of a foot. How it came thither I knew not, nor could in the least imagine, but after innumerable fluttering thoughts, like a man perfectly confused and out of myself, I came home to my fortification, not feeling, as we say, the ground I went on, but terrified to the last degree, looking behind me at every two or three steps, mistaking every bush and tree, and fancying every stump at a distance to be a man. Nor is it possible to describe how many various shapes my affrighted imagination represented things to me in, how many wild ideas were found every moment in my fancy, and what strange, unaccountable whimsies came into my thoughts by the way. When I came to my castle, for so I think I called it ever after this, I fled into it like one pursued, whether I went over by the ladder as first contrived, or went in at the hole in the rock, which I had called a door, I cannot remember. No, nor could I remember the next morning, for never frightened hare fled to cover, or fox to earth, with more terror of mine than I to this retreat. I slept none that night. The further I was from the occasion of my fright, the greater my apprehensions were, which is something contrary to the nature of things, and especially to the usual practice of all creatures in fear. But I was so embarrassed with my own frightful ideas of the thing that I formed nothing but dismal imaginations to myself, even though I was not a great way off. Sometimes I fancied it must be the devil, and reason joined in with me in the supposition, for how should any other thing in human shape come into this place? Where was the vessel that brought them? What marks were there of any other footsteps? And how was it possible a man should come there? But then, to think that Satan should take human shape upon him in such a place where there could be no manner of occasion for it, but to leave the print of his foot behind him, and that even for no purpose too, for he could not be sure I should see it. This was an amusement the other way. I considered that the devil might have found out abundance of other ways to have terrified me than this of the single print of a foot, that as I lived quiet on the other side of the island, he would never have been so simple as to leave a mark in a place where it was ten thousand to one whether I should ever see it or not, and in the sand too, which the first surge of the sea upon a high wind would have defaced entirely. All this seemed inconsistent with the thing itself and with all the notions we usually entertain of the subtly of the devil. Abundance of such things as these assisted to argue me out of all apprehensions of its being the devil, and I presently concluded then that it must be some more dangerous creature, that it must be some of the savages of the mainland opposite, who had wandered out to sea in their canoes, and either driven by the currents or by the contrary winds, had made the island, and had been on shore, but were gone away again to sea, being as loath, perhaps, to have stayed in this desolate island as I would have been to have had them. While these reflections were rolling in my mind, I was very thankful in my thoughts that I was so happy as not to be thereabouts at that time, or that they did not see my boat, by which they would have concluded that some inhabitants had been in the place, and perhaps have searched further for me. Then terrible thoughts racked my imagination about their having found out my boat, and that there were people here, and that, if so, I should certainly have them come again in greater numbers and devour me, that, if it should happen that they should not find me, Yet they would find my enclosure, destroy all my corn, and carry away all my flock of tame goats, and I should perish at last for mere want. Thus my fear banished all my religious hope, all that former confidence in God, which was founded upon such wonderful experience as I had had of His goodness, as if He that had fed me by miracle hitherto could not preserve 
by his power the provision which he had made for me by his goodness. I reproached myself with my laziness that would not sow any more corn one year than would just serve me till the next season, as if no accident could intervene to prevent my enjoying the crop that was upon the ground. And this I thought so just a reproof that I resolved for the future to have two or three years' corn beforehand, so that, whatever might come, I might not perish for want of bread. How strange a checker work of providence is the life of man, and by what secret different springs are the affections hurried about as different circumstances present. Today we love what tomorrow we hate. Today we seek what tomorrow we shun. Today we desire what tomorrow we fear. Nay, even tremble at the apprehensions of. This was exemplified in me at this time in the most lively manner imaginable. For I, whose only affliction was that I seemed banished from human society, that I was alone, circumcised by the boundless ocean, cut off from mankind, and condemned to what I call silent life, that I was as one whom heaven thought not worthy to be numbered among the living, or to appear among the rest of his creatures, that to have seen one of my own species would have seemed to me a raising me from death to life, and the greatest blessing that heaven itself, next to the supreme blessing of salvation, could bestow, I say that I should now tremble at the very apprehensions of seeing a man, and was ready to sink into the ground at but the shadow or silent appearance of a man having set his foot in the island. Such is the uneven state of human life, and it afforded me a great many curious speculations afterwards, when I had a little recovered my first surprise. I considered that this was the station of life the infinitely wise and good providence of God had determined for me, that, as I could not foresee what the ends of divine wisdom might be in all this, so I was not to dispute his sovereignty, who, as I was his creature, had an undoubted right by creation to govern and dispose of me absolutely as he thought fit, and who, as I was a creature that had offended him, had likewise a judicial right to condemn me to what punishment he thought fit, and that it was my part to submit to bear his indignation, because I had sinned against him. I then reflected that as God, who is not only righteous but omnipotent, had thought fit thus to punish and afflict me, so he was able to deliver me, that if he did not think fit to do so, it was my unquestioned duty to resign myself absolutely and entirely to his will, and, on the other hand, it was my duty also to hope in him, pray to him, and quietly to attend to the dictates and directions of his daily providence. These thoughts took me up many hours, days, nay, I may say weeks and months, and one particular effect of my cogitations on this occasion I cannot omit. One morning early, lying in my bed, and filled with thoughts about my danger from the appearance of savages, I found it discomposed me very much, upon which these words of the scripture came into my thoughts. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Upon this, rising cheerfully out of my bed, my heart was not only comforted, I was guided and encouraged to pray earnestly to God for deliverance. When I had done praying, I took up my Bible, and opening it to read, the first words that presented to me were, Wait on the Lord, and be of good cheer, and He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. It is impossible to express the comfort this gave me. In answer, I thankfully laid down the book, and was no more sad, at least on that occasion. In the middle of these cogitations, apprehensions, and reflections, it came into my thoughts one day that all this might be a mere chimera of my own, and that this foot might be the print of my own foot, 
when I came on shore from my boat. This cheered me up a little, too, and I began to persuade myself it was all a delusion, that it was nothing else but my own foot. And why might I not come that way from the boat, as well as I was going that way to the boat? Again, I considered also that I could by no means tell for certain where I had trod and where I had not, and that if, at last, this was only the print of my own foot, I had played the part of those fools who try to make the stories of specters and apparitions, and then are frightened at them more than anybody. Now I began to take courage, and to peep abroad again, for I had not stirred out of my castle for three days and nights, so that I began to starve for provisions, for I had little or nothing within doors but some barley cakes and water. Then I knew that my goats wanted to be milked too, which usually was my evening diversion, and the poor creatures were in great pain and inconceivable for want of it. And indeed, it almost spoiled some of them, and almost dried up their milk. Encouraging myself, therefore, with the belief that this was nothing but the print of one of my own feet, and that I might be truly said to start at my own shadow, I began to go abroad again, and went to my country house to milk my flock. But to see with what fear I had went forward, how often I looked behind me, how I was ready every now and then to lay down my basket and run for my life, it would have made anyone have thought I was hunted with an evil conscience, or that I had been lately most terribly frightened, and so indeed I had. However, I went down thus two or three days, and having seen nothing, I began to be a little bolder and to think there was really nothing in it but my own imagination. But I could not persuade myself fully of this till I should go down to the shore again and see this print of a foot and measure it by my own and see if there was any similitude or fitness that I might be assured it was my own foot. But when I came to that place, first, it appeared evidently to me that when I laid up my boat, I could not possibly be on shore anywhere thereabouts. Secondly, when I came to measure the mark with my own foot, I found my foot not so large by a great deal. Both these things filled my head with new imaginations, and gave me the vapors again to the highest degree, so that I shook with cold like one in an ague, and I went home again, filled with the belief that some man or men had been on shore there, or, in short, that the island was inhabited, and I might be surprised before I was aware, and what course to take for my security I knew not. Oh, what ridiculous resolution men take when possessed with fear! It deprives them of the use of these means which reason offers for their relief. The first thing I proposed to myself was to throw down my enclosures and turn all my tame cattle wild into the woods, lest the enemy should find them, and then frequent the island in prospect of the same, or the like booty. Then the simple thing of digging up my two cornfields, lest they should find such a grain there, and still be prompted to frequent the island. Then to demolish my bower and tent, that they might not see any vestige of habitation, and be prompted to look further, in order to find out the person inhabiting. These were the subject of the first night's cogitations after I was come home again, while the apprehensions which had so overrun my mind were fresh upon me, and my head was full of vapors. Thus, fear of danger is ten thousand times more terrifying than danger itself when apparent to the eyes, and we find the burden of anxiety greater by much than the evil which we were anxious about. And what was worse than all this? I had not that relief in this trouble that from the resignation I used to practice I hoped to have. I looked, I thought, like Saul, who complained not only that the Philistines were upon him, but that God had forsaken him, for I did not now take due ways to compass my mind by crying to God in my distress and resting upon his providence, as I had done before, for my defense and deliverance, which, if I had done, I had at least been more cheerfully supported under this new surprise, and perhaps carried through it with more resolution. 
this confusion